recording. And welcome everybody. Um, this is the November 16th teaching and learning call and we are excited to have Adam Marshall and Lucy Talents here today to um, present on their Shoal project, which stands for Shareable Online Activities in learning or something very close to that. I hope I got that close. Right. One of you can correct me. It's close um, enough. It's, it should okay. be on the screen. Oh, yes. Activities for learning. Thank you. Indeed it is. Um, so I have pasted the link to the Etherpad um, and I'll paste it again for anybody who's just signed on. Um, so you can sign in over there on Etherpad and take a look at the agenda for today. Uh, we're going to start with some project updates and announcements. And I know um, Neil has a few posted there. So Neil, I'll go ahead and let you go through those. Sure, and others are certainly welcome to jump in with announcements, but here were some I could think of. Uh, most of you hopefully have seen that we got Sakai 11.2 released on Friday. Um, it was a big maintenance release, 220 improvements and fixes. So that's a big, uh, exciting news for the community. Um, I just had mentioned, and let's see, um, some things coming up, and thank you to the whole, you know, community, the worldwide community. It was a great, uh, great release effort. Um, we have a webinar tomorrow on a proposed new feature that I believe has been mostly done already, so it's more of a contribution, I believe, from Unicon, uh, using it tags um, in Saka and Samago, test and quizzes, that so that should be, today that's actually, that's today. I'm sorry, today. In fact, I put that here today after this meeting, right after this meeting, but in room one of uh, Big Blue Button. Yeah, it's today, okay, right after this one. Um, so that should be interesting. Um, and it's a, also a potential, ser it's a service, the way they're designing it is a service that could be used potentially by other tools in Sakai. So that that's also interesting, I think. Um, mm -hmm. Ian Dolphin shared with me that there's a, a webinar coming on December 14th for a project that is an incubation um, and it's called Active Learning with Image Quiz and there'll be more details coming out for that. Um, what I see on description is uh, here is active student engagement is essential for effective learning but can be difficult to achieve. Aperio's new incubation project Image Quiz addresses this need by adapting proven cognitive strategies to create effective homework. The image quiz programs are aimed at creating effective study routines for use outside of the classroom. The webinar will be to introduce the three programs in the image quiz family and will review some of the basics of effective learning. As its name suggests, image quiz is focused on visual learning. With the proper selection and presentation of images, students can quickly and effectively learn new concepts outside of class. This free class time for other types of this frees up class time for other types of learning. So that Again, December 14th at noon Eastern uh, is uh, coming in December. Uh, um, Sakai Camp, um, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, if you have any questions, we, we don't have to go into detail about that, but if you're interested, let me know. It's uh, being organized by myself and the PMC Chair, Dr. Chuck Severance, and we had a really fun Sakai Camp and productive Sakai Camp um, in January early this year, and so this promises to also be you know, kind of hopefully that same energy. It's kind of unconference style. The people who attend decide what the topics are. We started brainstorming some of those topics um, and we get into some working groups and it's it's pretty cool. So if you're interested in that, uh, take a look. Um, and then I want to remind everybody that the Open Aperio uh, Conference, uh, which is in Philadelphia next year, um, that the deadline for proposals is November 28th, which is, right, <coughs> excuse me, right around Thanksgiving. So that's an easy one to kind of slip by. So remember to, please remember to get your proposals on. Awesome, thank you, Neil. A You're lot welcome. of good stuff going on this time of year. That's very cool. Um, Matt Burgess uh, on the UVA Collab Sakai team uh, wanted to talk about a peer review um, issue and uh, proposal. So Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you to describe that. Okay, thanks Tricia. Hope everybody can hear me okay. If you can't, just let me know in the chat and I'll try to speak louder or do something differently. But I just good. wanted to, oh good. I just wanted to take a minute to talk about 
something that UVA encountered just in the last month or so while they were working with an instructor who wanted to use the peer assessment feature in the assignments tool and bring our situation before the group so that you all can give us some feedback on how we collectively might want to proceed with peer assessment settings in the assignments tool. So we were working with an instructor who teaches in the media studies department here at UVA and what that instructor wanted to do was use peer assessment really as peer review. So he wanted the students to be able to review one another's work. He wanted the students to be able to see the feedback from their peer reviewers. And then he wanted the students to be able to resubmit their assignment after seeing comments from the instructor and or the peer reviewers. And unfortunately, as we did some testing in supporting him on this issue, we found that currently the settings for peer assessment in the assignments tool don't allow that workflow. Uh, what they allow is, as the name implies, for peer grading. And so because it is essentially peer grading, that student feedback is delivered at the time when grades and comments are normally available, which is when the assignment is returned and can no longer be submitted. So right now, there's currently no way to configure the assignments tool or a particular assignment enabled for peer assessment such that the students can get comments from their peer reviewers and then resubmit the assignment because that feedback is not available to them until the time when all opportunities for resubmissions have ended. So the current workaround for this would be to create a separate assignment, a second submission, and then for the students to resubmit their assignment to this second assignment after they had gotten all of their comments back from their peer graders or reviewers and from the instructor. So that is a okay workaround, but it does create some extra work and it does seem reasonable to think that instructors would also want to use the peer assessment as actual peer review in addition to just peer grading. So we wanted to put that before the group and get some feedback from the group on whether this was a reasonable workflow, if this was something that you all might have seen in your own institutions, just to get some feedback from other schools within the community about how they might want to proceed on this. And I see there are some comments from Lucy here in the chat which are very helpful, I'm sure. Um, she's asking whether it's formative feedback initially uh, rather than peer review as summative. And I think that's exactly right, Lucy. That's what our instructor wanted to do here all in one assignment. Uh, they wanted the peer reviewers to be able to provide some formative feedback that then they could use in preparing a final version of that assignment and submit it all under the umbrella of one single assignment instead of more than one. It looks like uh, Lucy has um, commented also that there's a course in Oxford that has a similar workflow but the peer review can't happen until the instructor has graded, which doesn't work well, which is obviously um, what, what we've encountered. Charles um, notes, uh, we have also had at least one instructor who wanted to do something similar. We use the same workaround of a second assignment. <clears throat> Shauna notes, we use the same workaround at Providence. Okay, so it sounds like there is widespread um, a widespread use case to to support an argument for for doing work to make this possible um, in assignments. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, Matt, what was our um, next step after getting some feedback from from the group? Well, I think our next step, once we identified whether there was a potential need or use for this among the larger group, would be to dig into the assignment settings just a little bit with our local development team and see whether we might be able to provide this functionality to the community. So I think now that we've seen that there are um, some other institutions that are clearly encountering the mm -hmm. same issue where they have instructors that want to do this, we may want to actually take some time and dig into this. 
Yeah, and Charles also notes a couple of other issues that they've run into. Um, one is there is a limit on the number of characters that peer reviewers can enter. And uh, I guess that has presented uh, problems um, at times. And also, um, they had an instructor who wanted peer reviewers to be able to add attachments, which is currently um, not a feature that's available. So those are both additional good points to consider. I, I Charles, have also seen that as well. I think there's a JIRA, let me see, I think there's a JIRA on okay. the second one about adding attachments to um, peer reviews. I'll see. Okay, if good. So a JIRA already exists for that. So, um, okay, good. We didn't want to proceed with uh, any work on this until we got some feedback from, um, from members of the community. So we appreciate that very much. And I'm going to, you know, if you have any other comments, please feel free to send them on to Matt. Matt, can you paste your email address in the chat? And that way we can go ahead and move on to our main topic. I, I think also, are you guys, um, maybe it would be good to have those, those that feedback on, on a list, you know, like make it more uh, accessible to the whole community? Yeah, for sure. We can definitely invite that. We'll, you know, kind of summarize the issue and invite some feedback. That's a great idea. Thanks, Neil. Sure. And I see that Mark posted the JIRA, and it's actually in Sakai 11. So the attachment option for um, peer review is already done. Fantastic. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> and I know okay. there was some work done on number of characters in certain fields, but I'd have to search on that, and I'm not sure the status on that. But I remember a, a re some sort of related um, topic around you know number of characters uh, people can type okay. in. So okay, I'll see great. If, yeah. Awesome. <clears throat> thanks everybody, and thanks Matt very much for um, explaining uh, the issue and, and starting the ball ro rolling on getting feedback. Yeah, thanks so everybody. This is really helpful. Yeah, we're going to turn the um, presentation over to Lucy Talents and Adam Marshall at. University of Oxford um, to talk to us about their show project. So, Lucy, I think you're going first. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, I mentioned the show project in a lightning talk at the virtual conference, but I don't know how many of you were there for that. So, I'm just going to quickly go over some of the 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 same introduction to the general idea, and then Adam's going to talk about some of the more technical details with what's going on in Sakai under the hood. So. What we're aiming to do with the Shoal project, which is sharing online activities for learning, is to try to encourage and promote greater adoption of technology-enhanced learning at Oxford, both to allow um, kind of potential flipped classroom approaches or to allow um, faculty to offer additional activities and give students different types of support, maybe when the faculty themselves aren't able to be directly there in the classroom. Um, at Oxford, we have a really good collection of case studies compiled by IT services and compiled by our continuing education department, but they are limited to descriptions of the innovative things that people are doing. Um, so you can look and you can see how someone else is using maybe a, a particular tool, tool or a podcast um, within their teaching, but you can't actually see the details of how they're using it and how to construct something similar for your own students. So what we want to do is make it a lot easier for people to actually play with the different activities that you can create within Sakai. So... We aim to do this by creating a search and share portal within Sakai and allowing students access so that they can try out learning activities. And we're hoping that that will trigger many more ideas about how different tools within Sakai can be used and how digital learning in general can be built into a course to support students and increase accessibility, allow students to study where and when is convenient for them. And we want to encourage people to try out new things, give them confidence by seeing what other people in Oxford have already done. And we're really focusing on what's already been developed within Oxford because we know that sometimes there's a, a kind of a, a doubt about using things that have been developed outside your institution. 
And it, it's sometimes easy to encourage people to adopt something if they can see that someone in the same situation, teaching the same style as them, has done something with online learning. So one of the key take-home messages today is that this is a very short project. Um, it's only six months. There's four or five of us working on it part-time, um, but there's a limit to how much we can do. We're going to do what we can, and we're really interested to see what ideas you can contribute to, to help form our own ideas about what we should be aiming for. Um, but this is really just a proof of concept to try and develop a, a new tool, a new way of allowing faculty to see what's being done outside their own WebLearn, own Sakai site. Um, and we're focusing initially on STEM subjects, but we very much hope that the university will decide to roll this out more broadly across different departments if we can convince them that it's valuable for the faculty. <clears throat> So what we want to do is showcase as many different types of activities in Sakai tools as possible, just because we know that people don't necessarily take on an entire course. When, when you're working with um, open educational resources or you're sharing online learning resources, you may not want to take the whole thing as it is. You very often, um, it's more important that you get new ideas sparked in your head about how you can achieve a particular learning objective using a digital tool or how you can build um, an online activity in using a tool within Sakai that's very easy for you to access already. So we're hoping that these are these are examples of some of the, the things that we hope will transform the way that people at Oxford use online learning and that will inspire them as they can see the benefits both to their students but also to themselves in terms of saving their own time. So that's why we're really focusing on things like automated feedback, using tests and possibly embedded dirty and also much trying to create collaborative activities with students and include as much kind of peer feedback and peer assessment as possible. So what I'm going to do is hand you over to Adam now, and he's going to tell you a little bit more about how what we're trying to develop in Sakai and how that's going to be helpful. So Tricia, uh, if you could hand over presenting to Adam. Thanks, Lucy. We'll have to. Oh, I've got presenting now. Um, yeah. So I, um, you know, kind of do the web learn support, as it were, in the university. So my uh, my take on the project is from the slightly more technical angle. So um, this is kind of the work inside Sakai. Um, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about. So this is a brief summary, and then I was going to talk a little bit more about each point in, in slightly more detail. So what we're thinking is, um, and this is not set in stone, there may well be a better way of doing things, um, but this is the current thinking, is that we'll have a special new site type called repo, or possibly repository, um, and that will, it's a, you know, it's a similar kind of idea to there being um, a, a site which is a template. Um, you know, so if you have template sites in Sakai, then when you're creating a new site, you can choose from one of the available templates. So, uh, but the templates is actually done in a, in a different way. So that's why I'm saying not all these things are set in stone. So it's a similar kind of concept to the, to the um, template anyway. But these sites um, are good examples of learning kind of thing. So the main bit of work in the project will be this here repo browser. Um, I think most of the other things that you know we're going to do on the on the Sakai side are just using existing functionality as it were. Um, yeah, a little bit of um, stuff um, based uh, around search, but uh, but the repo browser will I'm sure be the biggest biggest thing. Um, one of the things uh, that we also wanted to do is, uh, and I can't remember whether Lucy just said this, uh, <laughs> I was doing my email, uh, in, uh, that we have um, an instance of Moodle here. Well, I probably have more than one instance of Moodle at Oxford, but there's one specific instance of Moodle which has some um, useful content in there, which we would like to point people at. And so what we wanted to do is somehow get that um, content sitting in a third party system to appear in the repository browser as well. 
So there's a little bit of a, a bit, bit of thinking to be done about that. And possibly, although it's probably beyond the scope of the projects, um, possibly wanting to allow people to import material, which is a bit like creating a new site from a template. Uh, it's a bit like that, and that crossed with importing um, stuff from a site. So drilling down then very slightly. So I say new site type. Yes, well, um, this is the sort of ideas we had. Uh, we define this new repository type, which is very simple. Basically, you just create a type uh, site of that type in the, uh, using the sites tool, and there you have it. Um, you can do some wizard Java stuff. Basically, you can write a, a thing called a site advisor, which kind of listens in to repository sites and controls how things work. So you might, uh, you know, want a certain action to take place when somebody does something on the site, and I believe that the site advisor can be programmed to um, you know, do this particular action. Now, I, we might not actually need this, but we'll certainly look into it. One of the main parts of the project is the ability to use metadata. So um, tag a site, if you like, um, with a lot of metadata, and then let people search based on the metadata. So there are a few ways we could do it. Um, the simplest way, I think, probably is to set the property in the sites tool. So we would think about what metadata we wanted to, to use, you know, what metadata schema we wanted to use, and then we would have a property, you know, author um, set to something, and learning objectives set to some text, and you know, things like that. So they would all be stored alongside the site. So we could do that using the sites tool, very low level. Um, setting up a number of properties, or possibly we could let um, people do it inside uh, site info inside those sites um, by uh, adding some stuff to the edit site information page. So you just get a few extra boxes. Maybe they only appear for these repository sites, or maybe we would let people add metadata to any site if they wanted to. Probably not many people would do it, but you know that might be might be um, might be useful. Um, Lucy pointed out today, actually, that if you go into the edit details page of resources, then at the bottom, which you might not initially spot, but there's two collapsed areas of, um, sort of input boxes and drop-down lists and so on, um, asking for optional properties and learning object metadata. And uh, we might possibly be able to reuse something from there. Uh, we might not. Uh, it was just, just an idea. One of the things we'd like uh, in the browser is to have a little little pictorial representation of what the site's doing. I mean, you see these things, and I've got some screenshots in a minute um, demonstrating what we might like it to look like. So we'd like to add some kind of thumbnail to the site. This could be done with the property uh, again. Um, you'd have to store the, the image somewhere in Sakai, but that's okay. Um, or we might just decide to use the, the site icon, site info icon, which you can add um, to your site in Sakai. Um, one of the things we'd like to do is have a, a public site description. So I think this is kind of equivalent of saying, yes, I want my, um, my Sakai site listed in the public index. And then um, that means you don't have to be even logged in to um, Sakai to see the description of a particular site. Um, and one of the things we probably want to do then is we'll once we've dis defined this repository site type, we need to set up the, the template in Realms, which basically you know, lets people look at the, look at the site, but not uh, change anything. So it's a very much a kind of read-only sort of role. Um, so when somebody who isn't a site member visits the site, um, we will give them permission to look at stuff, uh, but not change stuff. Uh, and that will then allow people to you know browse around the site, get good ideas, um, and uh, you know, develop their own stuff. So this is just an example of the, in case you haven't seen it, the learning object metadata. Um, in resources. Um, not a very glamorous page, I'll admit, but you see the general idea, um, you know, role and so forth. And I'm not saying we are going to use these same um, headings, this, this same schema, but it's you know, it's something we can do. Um, I think the next slide is, no, it's not. <laughs> next slide introduces the learning object browser. So um, this is the sort of thing we want in it, and I've got some screenshots in a minute. So as I say, this is the main part of the project. This is how people, how Sakai users, uh, as opposed to the general public, how Sakai users can log into Sakai and how they can peruse all the learning objects and see what they're about, search on different facets, licenses, all that sort of thing. 
So we were thinking that these are the sort of things that you need to see in the, in the browser. So we need to show a nice thumbnail, who owns it, title of it, the description, uh, terms of use, license, whatever. And this metadata that I've been going on about um, long, a learning object metadata. But it doesn't, as I say, it doesn't have to be um, the, is it IEEE LOM? I'm, I also get modelled up with all the, the people who own these metadata schemes. Uh, we'd like, in this browser, we'd like to be able to do a faceted search. So we'd like to be able to say, you know, show me all the um, all the learning nuggets which have got um, statistics in the title kind of thing. Um, we would probably want to be able to search the description as well, because obviously you can't fit every, can't fit that many words into a title. And yeah, we might want to search the metadata. So, you know, in the fullness of time, when we've got hundreds of these things, uh, we might want to search for statistics in the title and then search for uh, chi-squared tests or something in the metadata, I don't know, you know. So we're doing um, a simple a faceted search thing that you can do um, um, in, in other systems. And uh, what we would like to be able to do is to restrict like a full-blooded preview to people who are logged in. So as, as a general uh, member of the public, you might be able to discover that we've got these things at Oxford or whichever. But actually, when you, you wouldn't actually be able to get into the, um, the, the learning objects and route around. You would just see the high-level description, and um, that, that's all we'd um, show you. So uh, this is what the current site browser tool looks like. Now, I don't know whether people use this. We have this on our front page. And um, basically, this is the public index of sites. And the previous page of this, you can do some searching. I just went to the, the full-blooded um, kind of search results page. And you can say it's really basic. It doesn't have a thumbnail. Um, it does have the title. It does have a bit of the description. Um, so one of the ideas was maybe we could extend this tool. Um, but I think on the balance of things, we've decided that um, it's just going to be a bit too difficult. So what we're probably going to do is to have something that looks a bit like this uh, as the browser. Now, this is the OER Commons uh, um, learning object browser. And uh, it's just, we all think it's a really, really neat interface. So we will shamelessly um, uh, be influenced by it <laughs> and, uh, you know, do things in a similar way. So I don't know about the rating. Um, I'll say later, the rating stuff is probably an optional extra, but, you know, you can see things like subject material types, who the author is. It's probably a bit small for me to see, actually. It's probably um, something about license there. Um, it's not actually displayed on the screen, then there is the conditions of use down here. So that's one example. And you, the, the, the facets, facet search is stuff down uh, the left-hand side. So I've just uh, opened up one of the um, one of the facets there. And you can basically say, you know, click on history and it'll show you all the history items in the, in the browser. So that's what we were thinking of with the browser. And there'll be a few buttons like to preview and stuff. And, uh, as well. um, so that was that's the browser. So that's the main part. Um, a technical challenge is um, how we're going to display this stuff when there's um, when the, the, the material isn't actually uh, sitting in Sucker, when it's sitting in a third-party tool such as one of Oxford's Moodles. So the, the general idea at the moment um, was that um, there would be a Sakai site as acting as the sort of gateway. And yes, it would have a description and it would have a thumbnail and it would have metadata, all that stuff. But actually, it doesn't really have any content. All it has is an LTI link into the third party tool. So, and that kind of works quite well, I think, because uh, in much the same way as a regular Sakai site, the general public can see the description, they can see it exists. Um, um, and when logged in users uh, want to actually um, peruse the site, um, they can go into the, the, the Sakai site and if we set things up correctly in Moodle, they should be able to click on the LTI link and it should be flung into Moodle. And then they can browse around there with kind of read-only permissions and so on. So there's, I don't know too much about Moodle, so we need to have a bit of a conversation with the people that run it. Um, but that is, is the general idea. I'm just conscious I've not really been looking at the chat. So I'll, once Lucy takes over again, I'll, I'll go through the comments and I'll see if I can um, answer any questions that Lucy hasn't already answered. Um, okay, so I think we're just going towards the uh, the end here. Yeah, so um, a discovery then. So this is, this is obviously the most important thing in a way because you can do all this work, but if no one actually knows it's there, um, you, know, you may well have not done it really. So discovery is, is of the utmost importance. And we're figuring that the easiest way to 
crack the discovery nugget is to let people search in Google. I mean, we might have to tell them if they can search in Google, but if anyone searches for, um, you know, a statistic, an introduction to statistics at Oxford, you know, whatever, um, hopefully, um, if we do our job right, it will appear in the Google search and it will, it will um, be clickable. It will take you to a WebLearn site where you will be asked to log in. And uh, obviously, if you're from Oxford, you can log in and then you can go and play with the statistics material. So the public will see the description and the metadata. I'm not too sure how the metadata will appear in Google, but uh, anyway, uh, they will be able to see the description. So they'll be able to read about it a bit and they'll be able to search the description and so on. But actually, to see the full preview, um, you have to log in. And this is a sort of requ requirement that Lucy's passed along to us. I think a lot of the people who develop this material don't just want it to be completely publicly visible. So that could be changed. Um, individual instances of this, if anyone else picked it up, they can just basically set their site to be public if they, don't, if they really don't want people to log in, if they really don't mind that the general public have a browse, they can just make all their sites public as opposed to their sites being available to logged in users as we're going to do. Um, we can obviously place links inside Sakai to discover the material, but the big question is where do you put them? Uh, you know, you can put them somewhere and people will miss them. You put them on every page, but nobody wants an extra link on every page. So there's, a, there's always a bit of a, a question as to where where you put links inside um, Sakai to help people find this material. Well, we'll cross that bridge later. Anyway, so that's sort of what we're going to do. And then there's a bit more, you know, opportunities for further development. Maybe if we finish in record quick time and um, um, and uh, have uh, extra work. So one thing I'd quite like to do is um, write the browser in such a way that when the shell project finishes, we can actually generalize it. So it doesn't just search repository type sites, it will search all types and we'll get that lovely OER Commons influenced browser to replace the find, the ugly find sites tool that I showed before, because that'd be nice. Wouldn't it? So we could do that. Um, another thing is that, and this was initially in the project, um, but we, we sort of thought it maybe was a step too far, is to basically allow you have another button in the browser which says, okay, I'll import all this, all this material, you know, that you're looking at into my current site. So it's basically, it's sort of importing the learning nugget into your site. And then, of course, you can cut that material. Uh, as you see fit, you can chop bits out, you can add bits in, you can change the wording if it's not quite applicable to your subject. We could add a rating scale, that, like you saw, um, the OER Commons browser had. We might want to put something in a site. So when you've developed your Sakai site, you might think, oh, this, actually, this is generally applicable. So you can have a little share this site button and it would probably email um, some kind of moderator to say, have a look at this site. We'd like to turn it into a generally available resource. And then somebody could look at it and they could make a copy of the site and um, add it into the repository. Uh, we might want to um, enhance discovery by putting something in the lessons tool. So when you're adding content, you might you might be able to import, well, you might be able to invoke the browser and then import the particular learning nugget into the site that you're currently working on. Um, we might want to add an IMS content item kind of layer to suck I mean, it sort of has it at the moment, um, which is in this video, I think, too. Um, but uh, uh, sort of, I do some specific work with these repository sites so that you, from a third party system, you can go into Sakai and you can browse and then you can bring back a common cartridge of the site all zipped up <clears throat> with all the files and everything like that. That's something like uh, Xerties is aiming at, I think, next. I think they're going to um, add a um, content item message layer to Xerti so you can go into a Xerti, you can browse around, find material, uh, and then import the whole or export the whole thing as a common cartridge. So we might do that. And we might do it the opposite way around as well. So in lessons, for example, doesn't have to be lessons, um, you can invoke a content item message browser and browse a third party um, a repository such as OER Commons. Um, I think most of these things are probably outside the scope of the project. But if somebody wants to build an our work, I think we'd be very, very happy to, uh, to engage in conversation and to you know work together and so forth. Um, to do this. So I think that was my last slide, is that? Um, yeah. So back over to Lucy then, and I'll quickly have a read of the um, the chat um, that's been said, and then we guess we have questions at the end, uh, I imagine. Okay. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, and thanks, Tricia, for dinner. transferring it back to me. Yeah. So I just wanted to finish by 
saying that um, if you want to stay informed on the project, then we are blogging, and I will post the link to the blog in our in the chat window. Um, first of all, <laughs> my response to Neil. Okay, there you go. Um, if you'd like to get involved in terms of talking to us about what we're doing, coming to us with your own suggestions, maybe giving us feedback on our ideas, that would be wonderful. We're really curious to know who else is considering this kind of thing, what kind of challenges you've seen, and how you're thinking of solving this problem of um, making people's work within your institution more discoverable by other faculty. Um, so feel free to email me. I will put my email address into the chat window as well. And um, so now moving on to the discussion questions, we would really appreciate it if um, you would give us your thoughts either in the chat window here or preferably um, in the etherpad because I think that's a good place to bring it all together. And um, specifically, we're wondering whether you're working on or considering a similar means of sharing Sakai learning objects and what, ba what barriers there are to sharing learning objects in your own institutions. And do you think that the new browser tool that Adam has described could help to tackle them? And so I would like to invite folks, if you can come on the microphone, do so, or I'll repeat your questions if you, if you only um, have the chat available or the ether chat. Um, we did go through, there's been quite a conversation going on in the chat, and um, I'll try to capture some of it. A lot of it is scrolled off. and. Um, but uh, earlier, Neil um, suggested that the metadata might connect with the tags idea, which will be a service that can be used by any tool. Um, and there's a, that's the um, presentation that's following this one at 11. It might be worth um, checking that out. Any, any thoughts about that, uh, Adam? Oh, I. So sorry, I wasn't listening. <laughs> I was busy typing in the chat window. So what was the question? Oh, um, Neil had suggested that uh, metadata might connect with the tags idea. Oh, uh, yes, I just re just replied to that. Uh, yeah, no, I asked Matthew Bucket about that before. And um, he said that uh, if we want to do faceted searching, then all that stuff's built into Elasticsearch. Um, and so we use we use solar actually. Um, it's all built into Elasticsearch and solar. So actually, using the tags um, service was probably going to complicate things further. So it, I don't think ah. it would save us any time. That's not to say we couldn't use it as well. Um, I don't really know anything about it actually. <laughs> um, but the, uh, that that was Matthew's initial response. Yeah, so. Okay. So um, then, Lucy wanted to know if anyone knew whether the learning object metadata follows a particular metadata scheme uh, and I don't think anybody knows the answer to that question based on what we saw in the chat but um, some suggestions for um, looking at other OER um, organizations um, to get thoughts about um, how their metadata is schema works and uh, might be useful. Yeah, yeah. I mean I think OER Commons is probably doing the right thing. Um, so we can use them as our inspiration again. Right. I mean, is there, well, there's, there's Dublin Core, isn't there? There's, there's IEEE, mm -hmm. LOM, and uh, the, I think there's an IMS one, but I don't think anyone actually uses that. Um, that was one of the suggestions we yeah. made with the Dublin Core. Mm, yeah, so so we'll just, uh, we'll see. I mean, I think whichever one we use, the principle is the same. Um, so yeah. just kind of trust Lucy to tell you, <laughs> tell, us, tell us which one to use. <laughs> <laughs> Passing the book to her. <laughs> That's absolutely that. fine. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, so, if if one is using Elasticsearch or Solar um, as a search engine to um, uh, find these resources wherever they are in a Sakai instance, why do you need a um, different site type? Yeah, well, you need to flag the types, uh, flag the site <coughs> somehow as 
being a repository. Um, uh, do you? Well, I, I think my thinking was that uh, you know people could. This is um, uh, something that we think you might use. Uh, I think my Lucy has this idea of. Uh, sorry, Lucy has this idea of you know reviewing these learning objects. So. You, you can't just say this is a good one. It has to be moderated, okay. reviewed, checked, and so forth. So we, we wouldn't want any old site to be popping up in the search results. We would want it quite closely controlled. So I don't know whether we would use a new site type or just have a property a bit like a template saying, you know, repository site equals true. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably fairly similar. Um, no, it's not. Because uh, if you use a new site type, then you can have a new uh, template in Realms, which can define exactly what um, people who aren't site members can do in the site. So we want people to be able to go into the site, click on all the links, read stuff, but not submit assignments or edit pages. So we would need a kind of a new, um, it's like a bit like a new role in a way, but actually it's just people who just come in as dot and non, uh, sorry, dot all visitors, and they would have this set of permissions laid out for them to what they could and couldn't do. So that, maybe that's why. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think because as well it's um, quite a small project initially, um, we're, we're thinking that it will be a curated repository rather than just allowing people to say, yep, I want to share this. I mean, in, in the long term, it would be wonderful if we could just allow people to say, yep, this is something that I is free for anyone to use within the institution or even beyond the institution. Um, but initially, we're just working with a few kind of hand-selected resources because we want to demonstrate particularly good use cases and things that we know are going to be appealing and maybe just gradually nudge people who've been reluctant to, to dip their toe into the water of online learning. Right. Yeah, this is really interesting and exciting. Uh, I love the direction you're thinking about. Um, I know that uh, there are folks, particularly in the library here at the University of Virginia, who are very interested in promoting greater use of uh, open education resources and trying to figure out ways to do that effectively. And so this could be, you know, definitely um, worth exploring and developing, I think. So thank you. Hi, oh, you're very welcome. Well, Neil's been asking some challenging questions in, in the chat window, and it's uh, really great to have that input because I think we tend to get very much nose to the page, and you know, you're focused on your the particular thing you have to do today in order to keep the project moving. So it's nice to be zooming back out again and and be thinking about what, seeing how other people view the project and and what the potential is. And Neil, I completely agree with you that there's a very big non-technical component to the project, including changing people's behavior. Um, we're helped in the fact that Oxford is just um, rolling out a consultation on a new digital education strategy, which is going to be prompting a lot of people to start thinking about how to incorporate digital tools in their learning, even if they haven't been at all interested in the past. So. Um, yeah, I think I think that's going to be a good motivator for people to get involved in this project. But in general, there are huge barriers to including online learning in terms of just understanding the potential of the different tools, understanding how to construct an activity using the tools. Um, and a lot of that with, with people who are very time limited for their teaching because research is what they're rewarded most for, then I think it's a real challenge. Mm -hmm. It is a challenge, and and people's perceptions and um, assumptions and paranoia mm -hmm. <laughs> about this kind of thing um, is, is definitely um, a lot to overcome. Mm -hmm. So let's see, Adam, you're typing quite a bit in the chat. I wonder for the recording if you would just. Um, elucidate uh, some of your chat in, on... Yeah, sure. Well, the first one I did because uh, you asked me about the, oh, the new sure. tag service, so I, I did respond to that. Um, the, 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 the second... Um, yeah, so Neil was asking um, 
about uh, doing it kind of outside of Sakai, just doing a sort of another browser. And I think really the scope of the project is would, wouldn't allow us to do that. So, so doing it in Sakai is quite a small piece of work, and it's a sort of you know you can think of it as a pilot if you like. I mean, I suppose if people at Oxford went crazy for our browser, then we could think of scaling it up, or whatever. Um, but I think the simplest thing to do is to do it in Sakai. It gets rid of all the hosting costs, and you've got a sort of infrastructure there already, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it was Neil again saying, why not um, let people search OER Commons within your browser? And I think that is, yeah, yeah we could, definitely could do that. Uh, and you know, you could imagine there was a two two buttons on the browser: one saying search local stuff, and another one saying search the internet or whatever. And if OER Commons has an API, uh, we could query it and we could return search results. I think again, I think it'd be outside the scope of the project. Um, and also, there was this. I imagine there's an OER Commons browser somewhere or something. Anyway, you could do. So we would sort of be stepping on people's toes. But then again, you know, if it, say if it takes off, um, then yeah, that would be that would be great um, to do. So yeah. slightly slightly woolly answers from me, but <laughs> there you go. I put my email address in as well if anyone wants mm -hmm. to email me. I have a question about your timeline. So I I, I didn't. Um, capture everything that you said about it, but I know you're working through May, I believe it was, or March. Uh, March. Uh, 20, March 2017. So, so what's the plan at, after that point? Um, what's the, what are the next steps? Do you think? Ah, uh, well, the next step for me is probably that I'm looking for a new job. <laughs> Because <laughs> that's when my contract finishes. Um, but we'll be reporting back to the university with, with kind of lessons learned um, and trying to build in some way in which we can evaluate how, how much uptake there's been, how much use there's been, so we can start kind of presenting them with some figures on impact. And again, if anyone has ideas or experience on, on doing that, how you measure the impact of a repository like this, I'd be very interested to hear from you. Um, so we will, if we feel it's been a success, and I hope it will be, that we will be recommending to them that they roll it out more broadly. I mean, certainly the conversations that I've had one-on-one -on -one with people teaching in different departments um, within and beyond STEM subjects is that they're really keen, they're, they're, um, there's a proportion of people who are really keen to find out what's being done, what they can do with digital tools. So certainly anecdotally, I feel there's a good reason to expand it to the whole of the university. Um, and then, I mean, in terms of it being part of Sakai and being used beyond Oxford, that would be really great to to know how people are using it and how people are thinking it needs to be extended. Um, but it would be a question of finding the funding, finding out whether Oxford want to support additional development of that. Right. Do you guys, are you guys um, planning to present on your findings at the Open Imperio Conference next June, hopefully? I would be very happy to, um, but we, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether anyone from the Webler and the Sakai team at Oxford is going to be attending. I'm not currently intending to attend, but that's partly for financial reasons, <laughs> so I don't know whether I will have any money to pay for it. Um, but we definitely would, would love to get the word out on how the whole project has um, has developed and and where we are at the end of it. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure whether I will be able to go. Um, I'm just wondering whether maybe we should put a proposal in and then if nobody can go, we'll pull it pull it back out again or <laughs> or do a you know a pre-recording or something because I don't think yeah. I'm going to find out whether I can go until the deadline's closed. So. Um, I mean, it, yeah. if if presenting from a distance was an option, then yeah, no, I'm no. sure I would be able to do that. Yes, and me. Yeah. Maybe we should put something in, Lucy. Okay. I can, I can only say no, can't. Yeah, do it. <laughs> Even remotely, I think that could be done. Um, yeah. I don't want to speak yeah. for the planning committee, but. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for saying that. Awesome. Yeah. Vote of confidence, I think. Yep. Any other questions for Lucy and <laughs> or comments? Well, thank you both very much for this. It's, it's a really interesting project, and um, 
Thank you so much for sharing it with us. My pleasure. Hearing more about progress. And Neil's going to drop off a couple of minutes early. Lucy says, does anyone know institutions using their own content repositories already in any system? Yeah, offhand, I do not know. And Neil, uh, I, I, you know, I, I want to say that libraries, this is, you know, what they're all about sharing content from repositories. And so I can, I would expect that um, folks in our library would have some uh, experience with this already, but I don't know enough about it to comment further. So uh, we have just a couple of other items to cover before we adjourn. I just wanted to, um, share with you our upcoming meeting schedule and topics on December 7th. We have Adam Hauerwas from Providence College um, presenting on integrating official student photos into Sakai. So we're looking forward, that's our next meeting, that's the first Wednesday in December. Uh, December 21st um, we're, is still an open uh, topic. Uh, January 4th is also open and then on January 18th, we have a presentation from Sally Bryant and Grace Ye at Pepperdine University on Better Together, um, Sakai and SIPX, S-I-P-X. Um, so that should be a very interesting um, presentation as well. Um, does any, and so this is our opportunity to suggest um, some topics for some of the open meetings coming up. Does anyone have any suggestions? For us. Perhaps from a session you saw at the Sakai Virtual Conference that would be useful. One of the ones that I uh, moderated was um, student engagement strategies for online courses uh, that was presented by some um, nursing school um, uh, instructors and, and support instructional designers at Duke, uh, which I thought would be really uh, interesting for the group. And I'd be happy to reach out to them to see if they would present. Anyone else have suggestions? So Lucy suggests, can we invite someone to talk about how they're using peer review and assessment? Oh, that's a great idea. I'll make a note of that. Oh, yeah. Charles? Yes. It's always good <laughs> to have someone who is willing right here on the call. And Lucy is inviting Charles to possibly um, do that presentation. Charles, are you, or would you be up for that? Right. Charles, if that's something you feel like you would be willing to do, I can reach out to you um, and figure out a date when you could do that. Okay. Think about it. I'll reach out to you later and um, just check in and see see what you think. Okay. It looks like um, quite a few of the attendees in this session have already um, left. So, and Lucy says, I could check with my colleagues and see if she's happy for me to share what she does with peer review too. Oh yeah, it could be um, multiple folks talking about what, how it's being used. That would be great. So I'm just jot down and if anybody else wants to contribute to that, that would be also very nice. Well, thank you for the suggestion, Lucy and Charles for thinking about that. 
Um, I think we are at a good stopping point, so we'll adjourn for now. And thank you all for coming. And thanks especially to Lucy and Adam for your presentation. <laughs>